Hello everyone, Victor is here and in this video we are going to talk about complex substituents and their nomenclature. So first of all, if you haven't seen my tutorial about the basics of the nomenclature, go ahead and look at that first, I'm going to leave the link here in the description and then continue with this one. So first of all, what is a complex substituent? Well, technically anything more complex than a single straight chain is going to be a complex substituent. So of course for small substituents like a methyl group or an ethyl group, there aren't really any variations that you can do. However, starting with three carbons when you have a propyl group, we can already have variations. We can have just a regular straight chain, which is going to be our propyl or a normal propyl, or we can have a bit of a fork which is going to be the isopropyl group, where it is connected to the main chain via the central carbon over here, rather than one of the edge atoms. When it comes to four carbons, well, we have even more variations in this case. We can have just a normal straight chain, which is going to be our regular butyl group, or we can have an isobutyl group, where our molecule forks in the middle, or we can have a sec-butyl group, where we are connecting our four carbons via the second carbon, or we can even have a third butyl, where our structure looks kind of like a chicken leg over here. These are what we call a retained name. So isopropyl, isobutyl, third butyl, etc. Those are retained common names and the current IUPAC version does allow you to use those names in the construction of your names for as long as you're using just the retained names for the first four atoms. Any common names for five atoms and above that are no longer accepted by the IUPAC rules. So even if you know those names like Emil for the five carbon group, etc do not use those names. Another thing that I want to point out, which is very important thing to point out about the alphabetical order. When it comes to our common or retained names here, the prefix iso is counted for the alphabet. However, prefix sec and third are not counted for the alphabet. Also, iso spelled together with our molecule name, or our group name, I should say, while sec and third, they are not spelled together, they are spelled through the hyphen. So, for as long as the thing spelled together with the name, then the thing is going to be counted for the alphabet. It's kind of easy to remember this way. So iso is counted, second third is not counted for the alphabet. All right, so what are we going to do for something with five carbons or more? If I have just a straight chain, something like this, well, that's easy. That's simply a pentyl group. Nothing special about it. But what if my chain is connected to the parent somewhere in the middle? What if my connection to the parent chain is sitting in the middle of the molecule like that? What am I going to do in that case? Well, I think it will be the easiest to illustrate how we approach those molecules using an example. So let's say I have a molecule like the one I just drew on the right. First step in any kind of nomenclature, we are going to find the longest continuous chain. And in this particular case, the longest continuous chain is going to be our six membered ring, which means that the parent or the principal chain in this case is going to be just the cyclohexane. Now I have two substituents. I have a smaller substituent up top. Well, that's just a simple two carbon substituent. So that is going to be just the ethyl group. However, I have another substituent on the bottom right, and that one is a little bit more complicated than a simple straight chain. So the rules are the following. First of all, I'm going to find the carbon through which my complex substituent is attached to the parent molecule, this one. This is where I'm going to start my numbering. And just like for any other name, I'm going to find the longest continuous chain. However, the longest continuous chain has to start from that carbon where I am attaching that to my parent chain. In this case, my longest continuous chain is going to be one, two, three, four carbons long, just like that. Next, once I found my longest continuous chain, I'm going to name it as if it was a standalone molecule, but the ending is still going to be YL, just like for any other substituent, and we are going to take the whole name into parentheses. So in this case, for the simplicity's sake, I'm going to redraw my group 
So this is my connection point to the main molecule. Then I have one, two, three, four carbons and the substituent over there. So I have one, two, three, four, and then I have a substituent group over here. This is the methyl substituent group, which means that if that was a molecule on its own, the name for that would be one methyl, then the parent has the root but, but instead of ane, I'm going to add the ending yl, because it is still a substituent. And, as I've mentioned before, I'm going to put that into parentheses. So that is going to be what I'm going to add to my parent name when I'm constructing the whole name. And the last thing that I want to point out here is that everything inside of your parentheses is counted for the alphabet and the alphabetical order, which means that if I'm putting this name together, my alphabetical order will have E first, and M second, because M in this case will count for the alphabet if there were any numeric prefixes inside of my parentheses, like di, tri, tetra, etc. Those, unlike in the regular naming, would also count for the alphabet. So, as I said, anything inside of parentheses counts. So this way, if I wanted to give a full name for my molecule in this example, I'm going to start with the ethyl group. I'm going to say that in the first position I have the ethyl group, then in the third position I have my complex substituent, which is 1-methylbutyl, and finally I'm going to add my parent name, which is cyclohexane. Notice I am not showing any dashes or spaces or anything between my parentheses and the next letter. Parentheses, we're essentially treating that as if it was a letter, and we know that we only separate letters with numbers with the dash and numbers between themselves with a comma. So in this case, parentheses, they're just there, but we are not separating them or treating them as anything special. All right, let's look at one more example here. First step is to find the longest continuous chain. In this particular case, it's going to be the 8-carbon chain like that. The next step in nomenclature is going to be to find the order how I'm going to number my chain, and I need to number it in such a way as to give the lowest possible numbers to my substituents. Here, I would have to start numbering it from the right side, so it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 like this, because if I were to start uh, numbering from the other side, my substituents would be at the 5th uh, carbon instead of 4th, so here I have to give it uh, numbers from right to left. Now, the substituents that I have here, these two groups, those are the isopropyl groups, which is going to be a common or retained name, or, if I wanted to use the systematic or the IOPAC name, would give me one methyl ethyl group. But here is the thing, I have two of those groups. So whenever I'm constructing the uh, name for my molecule, I would need to say that I have two of those groups at the fourth position. And that's where we kind of run into an interesting situation. If I am using simple, common, retained names, then I can use my normal numeric prefixes like di, tri, tetra, penta, etc. However, if I'm going to be using the complex names, before the parentheses I'm no longer going to see di, tri, tetra, penta, etc. I'm going to see special names for those. For two, instead of di, we're going to use bis. For three, instead of tri, we are going to use trees. For four, that is going to be tetrakis. For five, it's going to be pentakis, and so on. So essentially, you are going to add your regular uh, numeric prefix, uh, starting with four, five, and six, and so on, and add a kiss to it. For six, you're going to use hexakis instead of hexa, for seven it's going to be heptakis instead of uh, hepta, etc. Which means that it really depends on which type of a nomenclature you're going to be using to construct those names, because if I'm using my common or retained name, then the name for this compound is going to be 4,4-diisopropyl octane. However, if I wanted to use the correct, well, I shouldn't say correct, if I wanted to use the strict IUPAC rules, then I'm going to have 4,4-bis 
1-methyl-ethyl octane. Sounds a little bit fancier, but that's what you're going to use. For the exam purposes, make sure you double check with your instructor how exactly your instructor wants to treat those things. In my experience, most instructors are perfectly fine you using the common or retained names for the first four uh, substituents. So you could use your isopropyls, your isobutyls or third butyls, etc. However, some instructors are particularly strict about using the IUPAC rules. So if your instructor does not allow using the retained names, make sure you're using using the complex nomenclature instead in, in every single question that you are going through uh, in your homework or exams. And before we wrap it up for today, how about we look at this example. Pause this video, draw this molecule on your piece of paper, give it a name, and then we'll work through that together. Alright, are we ready? So first thing first, we need to find the longest continuous chain, and in this case it's going to be right here. Did I catch any of you on that? Let me know in the comments below. Next thing, we are going to give it numbers and we need to give it numbers to give the lowest possible uh, numbers to our substituents. So I will number my chain 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, just like that. Then I need to identify my substituents. I have methyl groups here, here and here and I also have a complex third butyl substituent over there. So that third butyl can be named using two different ways. I can either use the common or retained name, or I can use the IUPAC name for that. So the common name, as I've mentioned a moment ago, is going to be the third butyl, and the IUPAC or the systematic name for that is going to be 1,1-dimethyl-ethyl. And from the perspective of the uh, alphabet, the common name starts with the letter B, while the IUPAC name, the complex name, is going to start with the letter D, because as I've mentioned earlier in this tutorial, everything inside of parentheses counts for alphabet. Which means that using the common name for my third butyl group, the name for this molecule is going to be 4 third butyl 223 trimethyl octane, and I'm going to start with 4 third butyl because I need to alphabetize my um, substituents. However, for the IUPAC name, I'm going to have 4 1 1 dimethyl ethyl 223 trimethyl octane. A little bit longer, but overall the alphabetical order didn't really change the position of my groups, because in this case D is still before M in the alphabet, just like in the previous case B was before the M in the alphabet, however occasionally that can matter, and occasionally the overall order of your substituents can change depending whether you are going to be using the common names or if you are going to be using the IUPAC names. So what do you think about the complex nomenclature? Do you think it's easy? Difficult? Let me know in the comments below! Also, please hit the like button and write a comment to help promote this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so to make sure that you don't miss any future updates. You can also find more practice questions and tutorials at my website organicchemistrytutor.com and of course you can find all my social links in the doobly-doo below. You have an awesome day and I will see you in the next video!